Welcome to How to Write Your Artist Bio, which if you're out there, you're not an artist, this is a great, um, the workshop and the video is actually great for anybody who's in need of a professional bio. Um, so you don't have to be just an artist to share your questions today. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to the Patrick Medford Library. Um, they've partnered with us to make this possible. And a lot of our programs that you see that we do together, we wouldn't be able to do them without the library. So we're really gracious and excited we could bring you this and a bunch of other virtual programming this, um, that's gonna roll out over the course of the summer. Um, but today we are here with Professor Giordano and I've put her bio in the chat so you can read more about her in case you didn't have that opportunity. Also in the chat is the link to the bio video, which lives on our YouTube. So you can rewatch that as many times as you want. Um, often you write a bio, you need to write another one a year later, or you have to change it depending on what you're doing. And we're gonna talk all about that. But the video is there for you anytime you need it. Um, and next week, we will do the same Q&A session for writing an artist statement. These are two pieces of information that are just absolutely necessary for when you want to apply for any kind of um, exhibition opportunity, um, any kind of grant, they're, they're always needed. So it's perfect to have them. You even need them for your website. So we're just really excited we can help you do that today. Um, today is all about question and answers. So we have a couple of questions we thought um, would be great to sort of kick this conversation off. And then as you have questions, please put them in the chat box and then I will um, read them back to Professor Giordano to um, give us all the wonderful answers we need. Okay? So thank you for joining us. I'm gonna hand it over to Professor Giordano. Well, thank you. Thanks for um, all those nice things that you said, Beth. I love working with you too. Creative minds, are, two heads are always better than one, right? Um, so we kind of had some questions coming in and um, I thought we would start with them. Yeah. They might repeat. I mean, these might be questions that you have, but as other questions come up, you know, by all means, jot them down so we can get to those too. Um, I think the first one you have, Beth, is... Yep. Do you want um, me to read it to you? I'll read it yeah, to go you. Ahead. Why don't you go ahead and read that? Yep. So the first one is actually even one, it's really from myself. Um, so my question is, uh, my bio is actually too long. How do I pare down the details that are the most important to include? So that's a, that's a tough one, right? Because we know that often bios have to be short and you might have a really strong resume. I hope you have a strong resume with lots of different exciting things, right? And you want to get it all out and you want to impress whoever's reading your bio. Um, I mentioned this in the lecture. One of the first things you want to do is ask yourself, is this a general bio or is this a bio that I'm writing for a particular job? Who is the audience, right? Like this is a really important question. Who's the audience that you're writing this for? And print that out like I'm a I'm a pencil and paper person even with all this technology so printing out the application for the grant the residency the job and then taking a highlighter and highlighting what are the specifics that they're asking for right so you now have a list from that from that request to start your bio and you also have your resume out with you right you have you always want to have a really up-to-date resume i reference my resume constantly because i want to make sure my dates are correct and locations are correct and things like even zip codes are correct if you if you need to include that kind of information and then you're going to start picking right Cher really cherry picking what goes into that bio um you want to have a balance between local things that you have done with things that are maybe more uh, statewide or national with a little bit of a broader audience. Another thing that you want to think about is Googling the things that you are putting in your bio. So let's say you have 15 things you want to put in your bio. That might be grants, exhibitions, places that you've taught, clients that you had. Look up those, look, look up all of that, Google it. And if you see that there's not a lot of information out there, Maybe you don't want to include that in your bio. Maybe that's the thing that gets crossed off because I'm telling you, I can say this with great certainty. People look things up. I read an artist's bio. I say, I didn't know about that residency in Maine. And I look it up mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is an amazing thing that this person did. It didn't have name recognition, but it has a, there's a great connection on the internet and the opposite. I can look something up 
and say, oh, this, this website looks a little fishy or there's not a lot of information about it. So maybe you don't want to advertise if that's a connection that you had. So that's a really good way to start crossing things off, tailoring it toward the project you're working on and start looking up the things that you're putting in print about yourself that you've done. Okay. Great answer. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Dano. Sure. <laughs> I think the next, so the next question that I had for this was, it's kind of a little similar to what you said, a couple things that relate, but you might have some other things. Um, but really, should I be writing multiple bios? Like, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you had said, um, you, you had just said, sorry, <laughs> what it was. Um, that, you know, to make sure you're looking at the actual opportunity and highlighting it. Mm -hmm. And then you had a one, you had some great examples of Cliff Miller, Ben Owens and Kelly Bell, right. who had to kind of do this process of paring down because right. they had so many wonderful things. So are there any other, um, comments that you just wanted to make? about naming names and local yes. grassroots versus well-known names? Yes, definitely. So when you are writing, again, you're, you are going to be doing multiple bios. So let's answer that, right? You're going to have like your core information. And then like we just said, you're really kind of crafting it for whatever that job is. You really want to think about name recognition and you want to think about where you place big names, right? So you have, let's go with the number 10. You have 10 things you want to include in your bio. You've looked all of them up, right? You, you've kind of looked up their web presence. But what jumps out at you that most people are going to recognize, right? Like on Kelly Bell's, I ended her paragraph with a Robert Rauschenberg, I think residency that she yeah. had had grant, right? If you, so if you know anything about art, you that's name recognition, right? Robert Rauschenberg. And when people read things, they read the first two or three sentences, they're going to skim the center, and very often they're going to read that last line. So a lot of the times you want that last line to be something that has great name recognition. On Ben Owens, he worked for the auction house Sotheby's. Now that didn't really have, it wasn't so particular to this craft beer bio that he was writing, but we knew that it was something that gave him some solid, uh, a little bit of more of a solid background in another area. That was in the last sentence, right? So think about where you're placing these also within the paragraph. And great point about grassroots. You want to think about local things that you've done. And again, kind of placing that strategically within your bio. Is this something locally that you're applying for? Then you want to make sure that you have that, you know, um, more towards the bottom of that first paragraph for name recognition. And, and you just have to have like this, it's like a delicate recipe that you're creating, right? Because you never want to forget anything that's small and local, because that can be super, super important. And then you want to also just, you know, sprinkle in um, some of the more things that have maybe greater name recognition. Does that answer that question? It's perfect. Okay. Um, and then I guess our next question would be uh, maybe for the younger artists. So as a, as a younger artist building a resume um, and a bio, what can they do if they don't really have um, enough exhibitions or things yet to include in their bio? What kinds of things should they focus on? Right, so that can be, right, that's challenging. That's, that's really challenging. That's like having um, a new resume, right? It's almost the same yeah. thing. So what you can do, you can do a few different things. Uh, if you're a student and you're if you're a younger artist and you have any kind of educational background, if you've had any types of apprentice apprenticeships, if you volunteered, if you've had any internships, anything like that that relates to the materials that you use, you want to include that. Okay, so some people are just starting fresh now and they might not have like student experience or educational experience. But I think some, I think I don't remember the first person that had come on. Um, Roya. Roya mm -hmm. um, is shifting materials, right? Like you have a really strong, I think you said graphic design presence, right? Yeah, a lot and of digital background. Yeah. Digital background. And now you're moving into fine arts. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. You can put that in your bio and you want to, you want to say, right. look at how successful I am with this material. Mm -hmm. And while, while, and again, you're not using, you're not using I, me, you're using he, she in a bio, oh, so you can okay. say, right? He, she has a wonderful background in 
um, in the digital background. They received these awards and grants. They're now moving to these new materials. But yeah. what have you just done? You've just you've just laid out how successful you are in a different medium mm -hmm. and in it, with a different background. Mm -hmm. And you are you're and you're being honest. You're saying and we're shifting and I'm, and this person is shifting gears. I think what I've said so far in my bio was like you know with an over twenty year. Right um, career in digital design, da, da 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 da. So that pretty much sums up. Should I mention like the companies I work for? Absolutely, at all? absolutely. Huh. All right. You, you want to, you know, you want to, and again, you have to really be selective. Edit, edit, edit. You know, you are okay. editing this, so you don't want to give a resume in your bio. But if there mm -hmm. are like two names that are the most successful uh, achievements that you've had. Mm -hmm. put them in that 20 year experience. Yeah, there's some recognizable companies that I don't have to. Yeah, then, then yeah. I would include that. Because again, a lot of this is like really thinking about the reader in mind. So if the reader sees, oh, this person was extremely successful in these volunteer venues, in, in these grassroots venues, mm -hmm. then they will probably be equally as successful in something new that they're, that they're experimenting with. Okay, cool. Thanks. That helps. Good. Oh, sorry, let me unmute. Um, our next question would be kind of answered a couple different things there for us, but I'm sure there are some of the most common mistakes that you can kind of remind us to keep our eyes out for. Right. So this is a big one. Um, and I mentioned it just briefly mm -hmm. when you were writing your bio. And again, just to just to remind you, the bio is about you, but you're writing not you're writing in third person you're not doing i me you're doing he she mm -hmm. that and and we can make that's easy to kind of forget that right because you're writing about yourself and you're being authentic and you're being truthful but it's almost like you're writing about another person so you want to make sure that you're always he she he she you also want to make sure that you're not using your first name so um, Alexandra Giordano has worked for over 20 years in the art world. She, right? And then you can say Giordano. It's a big pet peeve of mine when it switches to first name. I don't know. I, I just think it's kind of more casual. It's mm -hmm. less professional. So if you do want to re-mention the name because you don't want to keep using she and her, just use the last name. A little more professional. Getting back to this as well. Make sure, and I've read bios that have done this, if your first paragraph is he, she, you're not switching to I, me, right? Because again, it's just, you just get tripped up with this because it's, you feel a little artificial about it, right? You're, you're writing about yourself. Nobody likes to talk about themselves in the third person, right? It can be a little awkward, but make sure that you're not shifting um, to I, me in it. And another thing I, I wrote down here as well, um, be careful with your tenses. Really pay attention to what you've done in the past, and what you're presently working on. And, and that might be something again, and I've, I mentioned this in the video, that you read it out loud. After you've written your two paragraphs, sit in front of your phone, record yourself. And a lot of the times that's where you can catch tense mistakes. And you realize like, oh, that is just not correct. And I, I'll, I'll follow up with that as well. I, I even still do this on things that I write. You can Google, how do I use this in a sentence? How do I use that in a sentence? And you only want to use .org, right? Anything that's going to give you any type of grammar advice, only use a .org or a .edu. Sometimes you can even type in a sentence. Do How do I use the word staff? Staff's a tricky word because it's plural, but it's singular in a sentence. And you'll get examples, examples of um, proper sentence structure. So those are, those are mistakes that I see that um, I'll read something and I'll go, mm, that's not right. And I have books, but I can also, you can also look things up to double check yourself, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think our next sort of big topic that we wanted to touch on was actually just really specific to this time. And that's sort of um, some suggestions that we can have for you, uh, for the artists out there um, in regard to building more details uh, during this current climate, because some of us have a lot more time, or even if you don't, these are still just good suggestions um, for looking for opportunity, just different kind of resources that you're aware of that we can share. Definitely. And that's something that um, also speaks to someone who, again, if you're shifting mediums or you're starting something new or you feel like you have some holes, now's a really good time 
um, to get onto your computer and do some searches. And you can look for local grants, you can look for statewide grants, you can look for residencies, um, you can volunteer in certain locations as well. And that's really important to put on your bio. So some of the places that you would want to check out is, is NYFA, N-Y-F-A, and you can kind of you can look them up, you can scroll, you can see, you know what, I actually can apply for that grant. Some grants are actually really easy to apply for. Some of them are 500 words for three questions. And, and you kind of have this idea that it's, it's really hard and challenging to do, but some of them are really um, kind of basic insofar as the application. Uh, NISCA is another uh, entity that you can kind of Google and that's N-Y-S-C-A. And sometimes they're going to have smaller local grants through, let's say, Huntington Council for the Arts, right? Yeah. And these are, these are great resources. And, and on Long Island, you know, you have so many different art leagues and, and councils that are sometimes will funnel into these type of larger entities. And you, you really want to do your homework, right? And, and the summer is a great time to do that as well. The days are longer, so we have more energy and we can kind of burn the midnight oil. And then, of course, PAC, right, PAC, right. who we're working with, right, of course, um, because you want to make sure that you're getting their newsletter and you're aware of anything and everything that you can apply for. There's, there are some great virtual programs now. A lot of museums, a lot of galleries, a lot of councils are looking for artists right now in particular to really kind of flood the market with digital content. Mm -hmm. right? I know I've said it on some great webinars lately. And two that come to mind that were, it was really surprising um one was for slow art day and i sat in on this webinar and it led to an invitation to sit in on a month-long webinar for an art salon with other museums that were around the world and i just signed up for that it was open it was just open to the public and once a week i was getting such great ideas and content by having this kind of outreach and another um webinar that I had sat in on with P it's P O W arts, POW arts. I sat in on them and she gave me a phone. She followed up with an email and we had a whole conversation about some other opportunities. So don't dismiss. I know you're probably feeling so digitally overwhelmed right now. I know I'm kind of tired by it, but don't, you know, don't give up and don't put it away. Keep looking. Cause there's, there are a lot of opportunities right now um, because of the climate that we're in that, might be something available to you that then you can add to your artist's bio. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long answer. Well, right? that was perfect. And just okay. to piggyback that, we have, um, so PAC has been doing the Plus Minus International Virtual Festival. It's the first time we did a festival of that kind. Um, but we had 300 artists, over 300 artists apply for that. And so you'll see those posts go up about three times a day. Um, but I can just tell you on the opposite side of it that um, for the artists, it's raising their profile personally on their social media. Um, we get 10,000 impressions through PAC now. Um, so for us, that's extremely important for our social media, but whatever we're getting is for you. So when you're highlighted on our site or another art, um, art site like that that's doing a virtual festival. It's driving people to your website. It's driving people to your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter, your YouTube, if you're doing that. Um, you'll notice when we post for Plus Minus Festival that we're including all your social media contacts and you can see that like we tag the heck out of everything. Mm -hmm. um, but also that it siphons back to whatever your profile is that you're using the most. Um, so these virtual exhibitions and opportunities that are so easy, actually really easy on our side to put together. It's just like a manpower time thing, but um, they're so easy to collect your information and then put out. That's a lot of places are really doing more of them. I think we will continue to see them. I know that through PAC, we will also uh, continue to do them and that they've sort of offshot, like because of it, we now have offshoots of other programs like Stir Crazy, which is an artist talk uh, program that we're doing and Coffee with the Curator that John Cena is doing. And these are all things kind of rolling out over the summer but any of these opportunities are going to give you an opportunity as an artist to talk about your work and so the very first thing I ask anybody when I book these things is actually for your artist bio the second thing is your artist statement and anybody who's applied 
uh, to anything that we do know. Those are the top two things I always ask for. The third is the artist resume, which we're gonna still do a video for in the future. Um, but keep your eyes out. Definitely, if you don't receive our newsletter, please make sure um, that you put your name on the list. You can sign up yourself at our website, patchworkarts.org. It's free. You don't even have to be a member to get it. Uh, we just want you to have the information. And I try to put um, things about local grants in there because we also host those workshops here at the gallery. Um, so keep an eye out for them. Decentralization grant offered by Huntington Arts Council is one of the best opportunities here on the island. And if we don't have artists apply for it, we will actually lose it. So you, it's your job as an artist to apply for them. Even, you know, sometimes it takes a shot or two and that's okay. It's a really good experience to learn how to write a grant. And that's one of the best ones um, you can start with. Cause it's like an easy enough process and it's, and you'll feel successful doing it. Yeah, and I'm gonna jump on to Beth before we get into some other questions too about really thinking about your social media and tweaking your social media. Of course, what is your social media presence? Because again, just like, just like um, whatever entity you're applying for is going to look up the grants that you got and the exhibitions that you've, you know, that where you've exhibited and, and things like that, you're gonna look you up, right? So clean up your social media presence. You can even have two accounts, right? A professional mm -hmm. and then a, a personal. I know you know this. Um, and then also pay attention to your feed. Um, I get a tremendous amount of information based on obviously who you follow and who you like. So go through your social media and make sure that you're following every local, especially on Long Island, because we do have a lot of opportunities here, all of the different foundations and councils, because mm -hmm. that's how you're going to get a lot of information. And, and then of course, even broader museums and kind of statewide or even domestic wide um, through the country. So who are you following? Because that's also going to be a great way to get information, to apply for different things, to beef up for opportunities to beef up your bio. Yeah. That's a good segue into, um, we have a question from Mary Jo, and she's asking, should affiliations be included on your website bio or your bio in general? And her example of that is she's a member of Patrick Arts Council. So do we want to see that you're a member of these things on your bio, or is there a better place for them? There's, there's most likely a better place for that, right? Your bio is really about... Um, achievements that you have that are current achievements that are you're selling yourself right essentially it's just the truth like you're saying these are the things that I've done so affiliations um, if you have a LinkedIn page there's a whole section for affiliations mm -hmm. at the bottom of your resume there's that's where you put your affiliations right these are these are things that you're doing above and beyond your creative successes your bio wants to be about your creative successes and your professional successes. So unless the only time I would say perhaps include that is if you are totally starting new and you're and you're going to highlight like volunteer work and that you sit on a board or you have these affiliations. That's really, I would say, the only time you want to highlight that. Otherwise, you want to have really concrete, tangible um, achievements in your bio. Thank you. Thank Perfect. you. Very Good question. And Mary Jo, maybe um, also for your bio, I know you've had like a lot of your pieces featured in major magazines, correct? Oh, no. Yeah, not recently. The last time was 2013, <laughs> but yes. For her, it was the best. It was, that it, it's, you should include it though. But I, I did do two, there was one from last year, but it was more of a, um, not a um, not an editorial, but a, but a training. Like I, I, I did a, uh, Oh my gosh, sorry. What's the word I'm looking for? A tutorial. I, I actually published a tutorial in a jewelry magazine. So that's more recent. Would you put that stuff like that on a bio too? Absolutely. And yeah. if you go back and if you go back into the PowerPoint and you look at the short bio, Kelly Bell, she okay. has achievements on there from 2013. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and that's okay. And I had mentioned in that, but I'll say it again now. I mentioned it in the lecture. Just as long as you're sticking to chronological order, right? And as long as you're, again, consistent. So if you're gonna start with the most recent and go back or conversely, like 2013 and move up to the, your more recent, just be consistent. Right. With however you, whichever you choose, I would do the most recent and yes. then go back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tw you know, 2013, it's, it, it's not like it's 1975, you know? Right. like. That, True. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you look at hers, she has 2013, 2014 on hers. So, okay. 
<laughs> What's that? I do too. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I guess to to piggyback on that though, because because um, an artist, I, I'm an artist as a second career, if you will. So my question is, and and I primarily try to sell my art. For me specifically, I've never had a um, like a showing because I'm a jewelry artist. Then, so okay. I so so I'm I'm a metalsmith, and it's it's like that type of work. So I have a website. Mm -hmm. So would would the bio with the same information that you're telling me here about um, like don't include affiliations on your bio, and it's okay to include um, your achievements? Would that work for an e-commerce website bio as well? So like great. an about us? So uh, yes, okay, so this is a great question. If you, again, if you go back to the PowerPoint. I what, haven't seen it yet, I apologize. Okay, so no worries, no worries. It's there for you when you can get to it. Um, I did try to feature like different artists and, and, and things like that. And um, Cliff Miller, so he's an illustrator and he sells his work. So he's not working in jewelry, but you, what you're saying sounds very much to, uh, very much to what he was telling me. And he, he has a website. And the bio that I wrote for him in that lecture was for his website. And there's actually a before and after in the lecture. And what we did was we did exactly what you said. In the bio, we did a more traditional bio. Um, it has notes in the lecture of, of things that he should include, like it's highlighted in red. Okay. And, then we, and then we did, we, I told him, add an about, an about um, Cliff Miller tab. And I have to go back to my notes because we changed some of the language on the tabs. We were really specific about the tabs that he had on his website because it was retail. Like he wants to sell right. his work. Right. And so, exactly. So we had one tab that had affiliations that listed museums, like in, a, in more of a list format as opposed to the biography. Gotcha. Does Thank that, you. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Thank sure. you very much. Sure. That's great. Um, I have another question here in our chat and Samantha wants to know, do you feel LinkedIn is really important for artists and photographers? Great question. That is a good question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I, I have, I had mixed feelings about LinkedIn just personally, you know, and I kind of ignored it for a while professionally and I've been digging more into LinkedIn myself. And when I tell you um, the amount of photographers and fine artists and and different um, di all these different connections that again are kind of like housed in this in this network, um, I think it's really important. I think you shouldn't discredit anything that gets your material out there in a really professional way. And LinkedIn, you know, right now when kids are in college, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but when students are in college usually junior year of college, they're meeting with their advisor and they're creating their LinkedIn page. Wow. For every major. Wow. Yeah, for every major. So it's, I think it's a really valuable resource. What you can do for LinkedIn, and, and I've done this before, and you, and you can go on a computer where you don't have a LinkedIn page if you don't want that person to see that you're looking at their pro, your profile. <laughs> I know that gets a little tricky, but look up other photographers, look up other designers and you can see how they have formatted their page and you want to make sure that you're in line with your industry so these computers are like encyclopedias right you have the more things you look up and get four or five six examples then you're going to be able to format yours better mm -hmm. so i would i would say yes put it out there yeah that's great um this is actually more of like a technical but uh, Roya was asking, like, how she follows, to so use PAC as an example, um, how she's able to follow PAC, but she can't make him an affiliate. So it might be something on PAC's end, I have to say. Okay. Um, if you can't make us an affiliate, I'll have to check because we've been very bad about our LinkedIn. <laughs> after, <laughs> I, after I posted that question, I actually went on and I found um, a section you can add to your LinkedIn that says accomplishments. Oh, okay. Yes. So I kind of just mentioned Patrick Arts Council and I'm like a member since blah, blah time I started. Yes. That's it. But, yes. but what I wish would happen was the little logo would appear. And I know. Like, I'll oh, have to see if it's something that I'm on then. Yeah. So, to do that. I mean, yeah. I got it on there. At least I figured out how to get it on there, you know, so that was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. I haven't, you know, honestly, we actually have not done a lot with our LinkedIn. Um, I have <laughs> to even LinkedIn look at so it important. because I don't remember who 
who even created it. That's well, wow. that's, that's my point with LinkedIn. It's kind of this thing that's like out there and then you, and only recently, like within the last year, have I put like grants up, all of my writing, and then to see it kind of explode a little bit and to see people requesting connections and asking that's to see great. things is, yeah, so check your spelling, check your grammar. This is out there, you know, this is for public consumption. So be really careful with that too. LinkedIn is becoming the new resume. It is, most definitely. Mm -hmm. yes. You can share it so we do. Yes. Um, let me just check our chat. Does anybody else have any questions that I didn't yet um, get to? I'm um, so far seeing that we've, we've gotten everybody's questions that posted something. Oh, um, but if you're if you've thought of something in the process, please. I'm typing one now. Sorry. Oh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, I, should, would you prefer I just t no, say it? Say it? That, okay. <laughs> sorry, I have two. I'm like I opened up Zoom in another phone so I could actually access the chat. Yeah, I didn't ask for um, question. Please do. Going, it actually relates to LinkedIn. So I and I hope this question makes sense. But I haven't updated my LinkedIn in years because my before. I kind of became a stay at home mom and pursued mm -hmm. my art. I was in the fashion industry. So my LinkedIn is all that old um, affiliations, if you will, my, you know, my real first original career. If I'm updating it, and that's kind of why I guess I let it slide because I really didn't think this art, you know, my, my artist life was very relevant. So would you, if I'm going to go in and, and update it and bring it up to date, would you delete all of that old information? First, this, is old a great question. this is a great question. First of all, delete nothing ever. Okay. Yeah. Have a file on your computer that's labeled writing. Okay. And, and you, you should cut and paste every copy, everything that you have on LinkedIn, put it in a word document and put that in that writing file. And, and I, I mentioned this in the, um, in the lecture. But I can't stress it enough. Anytime you write a bio, the first time you, even your first edit, never ever delete it. Never keep your first edit because you could write an amazing sentence and the rest of it can be garbage, but you want that really good sentence. And it's happened to me where I'm like, how did I phrase that? It was yeah. just so perfect, right? So um, as far as updating it, this is where you have to discern, right? You. I know I just, like I said, I just updated mine. Now, um, when I first, when I was a senior in college, so I'm really dating myself here, it's a long time ago, um, I had an internship at the Sherry French Art Gallery in Manhattan on 57th Street, and she hired me. And I worked there as a gallery assistant. And, and I also had an internship at the One Square Mile Art Gallery in Seacliff. And these were two things that I had on my resume for a really long time. And I was like, okay, we need to get these off. Like, I just, I, I needed to say, like, I, I don't remember your name. Okay, Roya, I'm looking at your name here. You know, <laughs> saying she had a 20 year experience in the fashion industry it's is a better it. way of summar summarizing that. So you, you're giving a little bit of insight to your background, yeah. but then you're giving specifics that are current. Gotcha. So definitely get onto that LinkedIn and update that. And the other thing to remember with LinkedIn, what does LinkedIn start with? A bio. Yeah. The first, yeah. <laughs> the first thing that you're supposed to do when you create your LinkedIn is to write that bio. So, and again, that's where you should be researching other people in your field. What's the language? You don't want to copy. You never want to copy, but what's the language that you're using, they're using, um, and edit it down into one or two sentences. Like I said, she had a long career. Well, LinkedIn, yeah, LinkedIn, you're writing, you are writing in third person as well when you write your bio for LinkedIn. Yeah. Wow. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank oh. you. Thank you very much. Sure. We have another LinkedIn question. Okay, sure. Um, Samantha asks, do you think it's worth having the premium account in LinkedIn? Mm. Uh, I don't. No, I've looked into it a few different <laughs> times. I don't want to, listen, I would never want to take business away from someone, but I also don't want you to waste your money, right? I think that putting yourself, if you put together a really good LinkedIn profile, I think the one that um, is free is good. And I think the first, actually the first thing that you can do is what I had just said, go into your LinkedIn, revamp it, update it, rewrite it, and see how many hits you get. 
And if you're getting hits from that, because when you update it and when you add a new job, you know, it gets sent out to your network and people get notifications about your updates and, and it just kind of spreads. It's like a spider, you know, it's like a web. So start with updating it and see if you start getting some more hits. I think that that will save you the money from having to um, go to premium. Premium lets you see specifically who looked at your LinkedIn page. And, and, and sometimes I'm like, Ooh, I really want to know. And then I'm like, oh, okay. If they really want to get in touch with me. They will, they have my information. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's great. Um, I have another great question. So this is, um, I'm gonna, there's actually two and they're gonna, they're gonna be able to go back to back. But, um, the first is what's the average word count or paragraph count for the bio? Okay. So if you open the lecture, I give three different examples of a long, medium, and short. And if how to do word count, you know, probably 500 words would be like it, you know, and that's probably like just about a page. You don't want to be more than a page. Let's say that if, if you're, if it's a long bio, you don't want to be longer than a page. Um, it's just too much information. You're just putting too much information in there. So what was the other question? Oh, the second one, which I'm sorry, I didn't even ask you. <laughs> the second one is from Lorraine okay. and she wants to know she's an artist and an educator. And should she, should, should she combine the accomplishments or should she be separated? That's a great question. I know so many people in that position. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to just go back to the first question because again, I want to really reference you back to that PowerPoint where you can see the different lengths, the long, medium and short, because I'm not sure if I answered that question completely. Um, as far as combining and separating, a few different ways you can do this. Um, you can, you have to, you have to write your bio geared to whatever it is that you're applying for. Right? So there have been times like, Again, I teach, I, I have taught for over 25 years at a local art school in Belmore. I teach pottery classes. I teach painting classes. I know how to work a kiln. I know how to mix glazes. I don't really ever put that out there anywhere. It's just not ever, it never seems to be, I love it. I love doing it. Um, when he calls me in and he needs me to get, I do the pottery wheel and everything, but it never really seems to be relevant to the types of jobs that I'm applying to. So I hope that that's a good example about some things that you might do creatively that you love and you're really successful at, but don't really have a place on your professional bio. Mm -hmm. um, you, what you can do also to answer that question is like what I had just suggested, um, an educator for over so many years, but her focus, professional focus is, and then you can kind of go into your arts. So I wouldn't discredit the art education part. I would try to put it into a sentence like that because we have so many really good art educators that are professional artists as well. And, and those skills, those educational skills, the people skills, you know, that lends itself to, it could lend itself to a lot of different opportunities that you're applying for. Um, but if this is an artist's bio, I would mention it and then focus on your artwork and your other art successes and achievements. So I hope that answers that question. It definitely does. And one of the things that reminded me um, is when I'm looking at bios or sometimes artists will send bios um, that they're using to apply for residencies specifically. And a lot of them are also educators. Um, and I always tell them to make sure they have a line about that in there because one of the most important things, and you wouldn't think of this at a residency because you're focused on making your work and it's its, its own thing. But yeah. one of the things they love is if you're an educator yeah. and you know how to interact with people because it's like an immediate, okay, <laughs> this person is a people person. They know how to interact with people. Exactly. We want them because when like you put a little gold star, yeah, yeah. It's, little, it's an extra star. It's extra yeah. point for sure. Yeah. So I would definitely mention it, but in a sentence or two. Yeah. Because there's such a huge skill set that comes with that. And right. they know it right away from one okay. sentence. When you say you're an educator, mm -hmm. they got, they got, they got a whole nother list of what you can do. Right. Which is great. Right. Um, are there any more questions that anybody has that they want to pop into the chat? Or anything you thought of as we were speaking, we probably have time for one more, mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Hi, Jane from California. Hi. <laughs> um, nothing, guys. 
I think they hit, hit all the questions that I had written down, so. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I want to remind everybody that, you know, next week, um, Professor Giordano will be back to answer questions about artist statements, mm -hmm. which are always one of the hardest things to write. Uh, yeah. So we can all use help with that. And even if you have a great one and need to refresh it, perfect, because all of the things she's telling you in the in the wonderful video uh, can help you repolish something you've already have written. Um, so don't forget to take a look at that. The link is already up. It's also on our YouTube. And after um, we finish today, I'll repost it. So you'll see that and it'll go out all week as a reminder as well. Um, that's really all we have for today. But I just want to thank Professor Giordano again for doing these videos for us and for joining us for the Q&A and Patchogue Medford Library for helping us provide this to all the artists out there. Um, so if you guys have other ideas for things that you need or want professional development wise, we've created pack chats for this type of um, professional artist chats also works as pack. Um, have, We've created it really specifically to address these questions that you guys and we've been getting over the past year. So if there's some sort of something else you see that you need uh, that you can think of, you can email me at info at patchworkarts.org and just give me your ideas. And if it's something we can put together, uh, we will do that for you. We do um, have a grant to offer Slide Slam again. Many of you out there kind of already know what that is, but Slide Slam is going to be a wonderful opportunity for you as an artist to present your work in a very short format of time. It kind of forces you to really hone in on exactly what you do and present it. Um, but we do that on purpose in front of um, an audience of professionals that are looking for artists um, and work to show in their own venues and organizations. And we're super excited to offer it. It'll be the fourth year we're doing it, but we're gonna be doing it virtually. Um, so we're gonna be able to actually include more artists than usual and it's gonna go live and be available for more organizations and venues to see. And one of the first things I ask you for on that application is your bio and the second is <laughs> your statement and the third is the resume. So these things will help you prepare uh, for those applications and others. But we will also do something like this, a live Zoom where I answer all your application questions and, and all the little questions you might have related to something like Slide Slam. We're gonna try to do those over the summer for any of the opportunities that we release. So you can keep your eyes open for that. Does anybody have any questions before we wrap up? No, oh, this was great, thank you. Oh, yeah. very helpful. It it was a lot so of helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Professor Giordano a hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we thank her. Thanks. And thank you all for joining us today. So hopefully we'll see you again next week. Join us. Um, we will be offering some more uh, virtual programming. So you can always just check out PAC for other cool things that we're doing. Cool. Uh...